Boa tarde a todos. Meu nome é Pablo Ibáñez e junto com o Antonio Giraldez somos Barlebu, uma editora e projeto de investigação à volta da arquitetura e da prática espacial. Primeiro, peço desculpas pelo meu português, mas acho que ainda dá para, para perceber. Estamos a apresentar Kering Assemblies, Designing for Better Futures, um pequeno programa público online que procura interrogar o design, a arquitetura e as práticas espaciais como dispositivos de exclusão e especular coletivamente como construir futuros melhores. Portanto, convidamos pensadoras, activistas, arquitetas e designers, cuyos trabalhos consideramos fundamentais a diferentes escalas, desde o corpo ao território. Kering Assembly é uma atividade satélite da Porto Design Bienale e gostaríamos de aproveitar para agradecer a, a organização pela oportunidade e especialmente a Magda, a Inês, Sara e Eleonora pelo acompanhamento durante o processo. Também sentimos muito não ter podido desenvolver o projeto na cidade do Porto. Gostamos de organizar as, as conversas em diferentes pontos da cidade, mas pela situação sanitária achamos que o mais razoável era mudar para um formato online garantindo o atendimento público e a participação de speakers de fora do contexto português. Hoje, a continuação, teremos a primeira sessão do programa, a apresentação da Ana Pujaner e a conversa com o Paulo Moreira. Depois, às sete e meia, hora continental europeia, seis e meia horas de Portugal, teremos uma conversa entre a Ana Naomi de Sousa, o Bernardo Amaral e o Senhor Baeza de Pina. Amanhã, às seis da tarde, hora central europeia, é cinco da tarde em Portugal, teremos a apresentação da Jara Rocha e a conversa com a Manufactura Independente, é a Ana Isabel Carvalho e o Ricardo La Fuente. E depois a conferência da, da Mary Magic e a conversa com Miriam Simon às sete e meia, hora central europeia, seis e meia, hora portuguesa continental. Na sexta-feira, como único evento na cidade do Porto, vamos conduzir um pequeno workshop mapeando futuros próximos no Instituto. Um híbrido entre um jogo de cartas e uma dinâmica de mapeamento no que tentaremos pensar coletivamente as construções sociais, espaciais e políticas materiais de um futuro muito próximo. E ainda temos alguma vaga, se quiserem participar, podem nos enviar um mail ou uma mensagem pelas nossas redes sociais. Sem mais, gostaríamos de começar com a primeira sessão do programa. E antes, gostávamos de agradecer também a Aurora Saceta, que fez o design e o código da website na que estamos a transmitir. Ao Manu Alba Montes, que fez as visuais de todo o projeto e esta paisagem na que, na que eu estou. E ao Alberto de Miguel, a.k.a. Horror Bakui, pela produção do som dos vídeos. Hoje começamos com uma, com uma sessão entre a Ana Pujaner e o Paulo Moreira. Temos a certeza de que vocês já conhecem o seu trabalho, mas a Ana Pujaner é arquiteta, investigadora e professora, com base em Barcelona, em Nova York, onde é professora associada na Universidade de Colômbia. É cofundadora do escritório de arquitetura Maio. Paulo também é arquiteto e investigador, com base no Porto, onde fundou o escritório Paulo Moreira Architectures. É investigador postdoc no programa África Habitat, e o seu trabalho à volta das comunidades informais em, em Angola foi premiado pela Graham Foundation recentemente. Desde o começo do projeto, enquanto estávamos a pensar as diferentes vozes que podiam eh, participar no programa, a Kitchenless City rapidamente veio à nossa mente. Achamos uma investigação fundamental para, para explorar formas de cuidar além do espaço doméstico, desvelando processos que respondem aos modelos capitalistas no território, propondo melhores formas de viver juntos. Também achamos que o trabalho do Paulo, à volta das comunidades informais em Portugal e em territórios pós-coloniais, pode ser um ótimo input para a conversa e não podemos imaginar melhor interlocutor para discutir interesses partilhados. I'll move to, to English now. We'd like to thank you again for joining us, Ana and Paulo. Uh, we'll let you with Ana's presentation and later we will come back for the discussion with Paulo. Both parts will be conducted in, in English. We don't have a specific channel for questions, but we would like to, would be very happy to receive your thoughts from the audience through our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts, and through our live streaming at YouTube. And we will share with them if, if there is any. 
I'll come back uh, with Paulo in a bit, and, and Anna, you can start whenever you, you are ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank um, um, not only Porto Design Biennial to make this possible, uh, but also um, definitely Walter Booth, uh, who, whose work I have been following closely. So I'm very proud to be part of uh, part of one of their projects. And and last but not least, obviously Paulo Moreira to to have accepted to to have a conversation with me afterwards. So yeah, let me share my screen. Yep. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that I have been doing um these last works, these last years. Uh, as as you might know already, I have been working about the idea of a kitchenless house, but that title is definitely just a provocation to start talking about um, the importance and the, the values that the kitchens do contain. And I realized about that very soon after I started talking about it because I started receiving this kind of emails that clearly show the type of um, worries that that idea produces on us. And that is that makes um, clear that we do have a love and you know uh, an attention towards the domestic piece that we don't have for other pieces and so for me kitchenless city and the idea of a kitchenless house is more a, a provocation to understand why does love have emerged and to be critical with it um it, it, it's like an idea that it's deeply related with um, the need that we do have nowadays to dismantle the modern house as we know it, to decolonize it as well. And that's why I'm very happy to be paired with Paolo because I feel that both of our works do mirror in a way. And, and this need of dismantling the modern house is deeply related with not only uh, the fact that we are aware nowadays that um, domesticity and in particular the modern house has been used as a tool to shape what we understand nowadays by the you know, nuclear family, but at the same time to shape boundaries and limits systems of seclusion based on gender, race, age, bodies, etc. So let me trace back a little bit to understand this conflict and to look a little bit of, of, of feminist um, um, historical survey before we enter into uh, the now. So this conflict that is embedded in the house uh, started precisely as many, many feminists have claimed, but among others, probably the one that we all have in mind is Silvia Federici, it started in the in, with the actually the emerge of the capitalist system, and as Federici uh, um, explains very well in her writings, it, it, it started precisely in the proto-capitalism, in the in the transition from feudal times to capital time to capitalist times, and in that time in that moment is precisely uh, when the idea of the salary and the wage, the idea of the body as a, 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 a worker emerge. And with that idea, a clear distinction between those works that were considered wage and those works that were considered unwage started to emerge. And with that, the distinction and the classification of also race and gender. And progressively, what is interesting to see that uh, these processes of classification and seclusion got deeply rooted within the house because the house was the one that the architectural tool able to establish those social distinctions. So all the work that ended up being included within the domestic sphere ended up progressively being performed for certain 
uh, so, uh, social uh, sectors, but also usually unwage or unregulated. Meanwhile, the work that started to be performed outside the domestic sphere uh, progressively ended up being the one of aiming, aiming economic value, social recognition, but also regulation. And it's very interesting to see those images from feudal times from afterwards because we, are, we see how in feudal times everything was mixed. So those distinctions didn't ex exist that clearly. Others did exist, but not these ones. And what is very interesting to see, uh, when looking backwards is to realize that every time that we have had an industrial revolution that uh, has affected directly in the systems of labor and consequentially in this uh, special division. And it's particularly interesting to see not only the first industrial revolution when women started to enter into productive labor, into industrial labor, so therefore labor outside the home, but in particular in the second industrial revolution that definitely that change um, uh, took over. And it was precisely at that time that thanks to new fools as electric, uh, uh, um, as electrician, but also gas, allow to change how the, the, the house was, in, was designed. And suddenly all these new domestic appliances emerge in order to repair that incompatibility of women having the need to work outside home and at the same time within the home. So to be able to take care of both works at the same time, suddenly the modern house emerged as this practical and very efficient machine in which labor could be done almost as a magic in a magic manner and effortless. So suddenly domestic work is starting to be, you know, like almost tireless. And we know at this point that that's actually just an imaginarium, so a, a construction that relates more with the idea of, but rather lacks of a real impact. And we know nowadays that it's still domestic labor, it is domestic labor and demands effort. But it's very interesting looking back, talking about, again about industrial revolutions and technological changes is what happened precisely with the third industrial revolution, when with the, the revolution of the media, when the TV enter into the home, apart from other technologies that allow the home to be interconnected and connected outside its own um, context, right? So the home started to be connected with um, else out the outside and that allowed to reinforce the idea of the nuclear family through the, the media and with that reinforce the idea of women as a center of the home and alongside that figure the kitchen and it's very interesting to also read at the same time Preciado because as uh, he explains very well, it is also at that time, alongside this idea of reinforcing the nuclear family, it is also the fact that this, the house started to be connected with other spheres, that suddenly those clear modern categories that work very well until then, like right? that uh, spaces of living, spaces of sleeping, spaces of working, spaces of production, and spaces of reproduction, etc., started to be blurred, thanks precisely due to that connectivity. And Preciado uh, explains um, this phenomenon through the case of uh, Playboy and this very, very famous image of Hugh Hefner lying on bed, with a clear domestic ambience while actually he was running the magazine Playboy, so working. And why I think is this all this is important? Uh, because we are living nowadays in a new industrial revolution, in a huge technological change that is related with internet and the digital medias. And that definitely is having once again uh, deep impact on how labor and more in and more in particular how reproductive labor how care work is being take 
care of. And it's precisely due to this change that we have an opportunity to rethink it and to rethink the relation between care labor and the house and probably to imagine different ways of um, organizing it and and taking care of it in ways that can be that can be able to dismantle those biases and systems of seclusion that were so biased and unequal. So how to imagine a way of taking care uh, and addressing care that doesn't neglect parts of society and it's more equal, equal, fair. So all these stories started when I was um, part of a magazine, a magazine Quaderns. And at the time I was working with Xavier Montes and Eduard Calles on um, a section called Domestica. And, and at the time, um, thanks to Xavier, I, re we, I started to be very critical with how um, housing was being built in Spain. We're talking about 2006, 2007, before the economic crash. And at the time already, most of our market was defined by this type of housing, a housing that reflects the idea of a nuclear family, uh, mostly largely defined by two, one, two parents, one, two kids. And the floor plan just mirrors that uh, hierarchy, right? So we do have the living room uh, in the form of this big head, you know, this big part of the key. And then we have a long corridor from which all the rooms do um, are attached. At the end of the corridor, there's the most important room, which is the main bedroom with its private bathroom. So just the, based on the form of the house, you can already establish the social hierarchies that are established within the nuclear family. And we were being critical with that type of apartment because actually at that time already, um, the population in Spain what was much more diverse and the types of family arrangements were much more diverse going beyond the idea of the nuclear and also the heteropatriarchal nuclear family. Alongside that work with Xavier Montes, I was asked to uh, translate the Grand Domestic Revolution. Uh, Faida Moshi at the time asked me to help her with uh, um, with an article, and and I was um, um, as many um, deeply fascinated by this book. Um, so my work also relates and answers to Dolores Hyde. It is a book published in 1981 that as you uh, know, collects through different chapters, uh, um, amazing um, domestic proposals, mo all of them mostly, um, that mostly appear at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, that imagine different ways of taking care of reproductive labor. And in the book, she names one particular um, type, the apartment house type, that emerged in different cities in the, in the US. And it, for me, it was very interesting because Dolores Hayden, Hayden at the time decided to neglect that type in favor to others that were pretty deeply rooted with uh, certain communities and certain ideological groups. And she decided to neglect this type because this type was deeply commercial. So therefore, deeply related with how, with a, a, a capitalist system that was very, but growing very fast at the time in 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 the US. And I I I I choose to work that out and to try to find out why did it emerge and um decay. So um for, for my surprise when I started researching about this kitchenless type, I thought that they would be you know uh, few in numbers. But to my surprise, I focused my research just in New York, and when, by, when I'm in New York, just Manhattan, and I could find hundreds of them that they all emerged from 1871 until 1929. And, and they are very diverse. You have to, I have to frame a little bit its, con, its historical context to allow you to understand um, the nature of this new type. So we are in 1865. It's uh, just after the Civil War, the American Civil War, when it finished. And uh, and at the time, the a it happened a huge migrations from the cities 
uh, did happen towards the, from the rural areas towards the cities did happen. Alongside that, there was a huge, very deep economic um, crisis. And, the, and, and one of the consequences, that there was a lack of housing. So uh, the, news, the newspapers were filled with articles uh, picturing the tenement house, uh, housing. Uh, tenements were the only collective housing existing in the United States at that time. And um, at that time, tenements were defined by just one room, no bathroom, no kitchen. So nothing, no infrastructures at all. And within that single space, usually different families used to inhabit. So there was the, the wish and the will to build up new typologies that would be much more, um, that would be better, but also much more hygienic for the, these new migrants coming into the city. Um, and right at the beginning, um, when the first, collective houses emerged, and by that I mean those that were dif different from the tenements because they had, you know, bathrooms and different rooms within one apartment. Uh, alongside those that had kitchens, there were some of them that lack of kitchens. And that happened because there was the wish to define a new housing typology that could differ from the European one. And at that time, there was a, a, the tradition of living in hotels, which hotels in the, in the US meant something very different from what we understand by hotels nowadays, but also what, uh, what understood at that time by hotels in Europe. Hotels in, in the US uh, emerged alongside the railroad system. So every time a city was connected with another city, there was the need not only to host travelers, but also to have a space of representation of this new society that was emerging, of this new industrial um, um, country. And so taking the influence of living in hotels, the this uh, new typology emerged in which uh, houses lack of kitchens and instead they had collected kitchens and many other uh, hotel services alongside. And what is interesting is that not only uh, fr right from the beginning, um, very soon after the first uh, ones appear, they started also to be open to the public. So the kitchens, the collective kitchens also started to serve food for visitors, acting kind of restaurants, but not legally considered restaurants. And what is interesting as well is to see the wide diversity. So the, the diversity of rents, but also sizes allows us to understand that they were popular for, for a very wide, um, what we could um, describe as middle class, but very wide uh, working class. Um, so and and we can we know that because we can find a floor plan as this one that is just based on two rooms and a bathroom to floor plans composed by very two extreme large apartments that as you see in the image contain many many rooms even a uh, few bedrooms for private service servants uh, but no kitchen at all. Uh, so that tells us that um, this wish to live without the kitchen was not only related. Uh, to an economic need, but also to an, a new idea of domestic comfort. Um, if you read any, not any, but you know, uh, say Henry James or Edith Wharton, you know, this uh, US novels from very, very popular and famous novels from the 19th century, second uh, part of the 19th century, you'll see that in them, uh, usually uh, for that society, it was quite unacceptable to have the rooms on the same level. By that I mean that domestic program needed to be distinguished in height. Rooms couldn't be placed at the same level as living rooms, at the time called parlors or saloons. They needed to be in different levels. And with understanding that system of hierarchy, the kitchen was the uh, piece that definitely needed to be placed farther away from the rest of the rooms. So understanding that condition, it's, it was at the time quite acceptable to get rid of that part of the home instead of having it at the same level within an apartment. It is also important to acknowledge that all this story that I'm explaining happened alongside the emerge of many utopian uh, projects, nowadays called 
utopian project that uh, were driven by the influence of uh, philosophers and ideologies as Robert Owens, Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier, that deeply, which uh, thought deeply rooted in the US and many communities emerged at the time, usually detached from urban um, uh, uh, cities, settlements. Um, and what is interesting is that during the second part of the 19th century, while these um, um, smaller communities um, emerged at the beginning of the 19th, uh, larger projects emerged during the second part of the 19th century, which envisioned the construction of, of, of large cities which would be defined by this new way of taking care of reproductive labor and care work. Um, I started to map all these cases in, in the island of Manhattan just to realize where they grew, etc. And it's interesting to see the different periods we have um, after with uh, the emerge of the railroad system, um, the train system um, alongside Upper West Side, suddenly that area started to, to, to be uh, deeply built. And with that, we, the buildings also are large in size. And what's interesting about this particular time is that at that time already, Central Park uh, was finished. So for the first time in New York, the idea of a view emerged. You have to imagine that the rivers alongside the island were deeply um, polluted at the time and not a place to look at. But the park defined the idea of the view. So for the first time, the higher floors, and I'm always explaining this because the elevator existed by then um, for 30 years. So it was not because of the existence of the elevator, it was because of the existence of the park that suddenly the higher floors started to be of value. And what is interesting to see is that the first program that emerged in those rooftops and higher floors were precisely those collective spaces. So the dining rooms, the different uh, um, shared spaces that these communities used to inhabit were placed at that uh, position showing their value. And what is interesting at the time also, we're talking about the birch end of the 19th century, which um, we, the typology has already 20 years of you know existence so it, there's a certain some sort of maturity at the time and what's interesting is at this time the idea of flexibility started to appear and be of value within the apartments housing started to be understood not as a single entity but rather as a set of parts that you could connect or disconnect something that already happened in hotels but never was never implemented into housing until that time. So rooms started to have more doors than needed in order to connect different apartments or a large apartments depending on the need. And that allowed that these apartments could be sized depending on the demand. And alongside that flexibility, what was also very interesting is that they started, the buildings started to combine kitchen apartments with kitchenless apartments. So both types started to inhabit together, sharing the collective services. Um, also very interesting what happens after 1901, if you see the maps before, the dots of where these buildings were placed and after you see this boom right so after 901 what um this boom uh was a consequence of the emerge of the first housing law the, ha the tenement house law the tenement house law was defined precisely to regulate those buildings that lack of conditions that were mentioned that i was mentioning before but without the will of of doing that but um so um, so they end up um, living outside the scope of the law, the kitchenless apartment. So kitchenless apartments after 1901, after the law emerged, the kitchenless apartment typology could be built, could built more within the same lot. And one of the consequences, compared to a kitchen apartment building, and one of the consequences is that after 1901, uh, with the same amount of rent, any city, the citizens could rent a kitchen apartment or a kitchenless apartment, but the kitchenless apartment included raw cook food, all kind of services to healthcare services, but also children care 
services. So nurseries and kitchen gardens also started to be built within those buildings, where buildings definitely have understood housing as a play as an infrastructure of care. Um, very interesting this period because the flexibility also had an impact on the types of rents and suddenly rents were flexible, which meant that inhabitants would pay depending on the amount of services that they would use. And that flexibility allowed them also to cook once in a while in the apartments. And that's how uh, this, the inhabitants started to first improvise little cooking devices and kitchen devices that also related with the fact that electricity and gas started to be implemented in those infrastructures. But what happened is that naturally speaking, different companies, first furniture companies, started to design this compact kitchen, a minimum kitchen that uh, emerged in the US way before, we're talking about 20 years before the Frankfurt Kitchen, the famous Margaret Schutteli Holtzky Frankfurt Kitchen. And at the beginning, the compact kitchen started to occupy any cupboard, any hook um, to allow to cook once in a while. But these compact kitchens were always related with a collective kitchen, never designed to be by themselves. And what is interesting is, as, as you see this, um, you know, it, the kitchens were considered furniture. And what's interesting is that these um, kitchens started to change its uh, meaning and, and definition and, to, and started to be commercialized uh, instead of space uh, saving devices as labor saving devices. And we see that um, in, um, we see that uh, appropriation through uh, the new movement, uh, the domestic engineer movement, which claimed to apply scientific methods and um, tailored methods within the home in order to reduce uh, domestic labor and in order to allow women to work from home and at her home. And these narratives that at the beginning were not that strong grew enormously during the first decades of the 20th century and they were precisely one of the motifs of the decay of this typology. So the decay of the typology happened for many reasons, not just one reason. So we have 1929 economic crash, we have the domestic engineers you know, empowering this idea of scientists and and pragmatists and and which end up being the modern house, right? And then not only that, we have a change in the housing law that suddenly didn't allow these kitchenless apartments to be so economic um, viable. And alongside that, we do have the red scars. So. Uh, uh, the red scars was a movement that emerged in the U.S. as a response to the Soviets as a response of uh, this uh, appropriation, uh, this ideological appropriation of collectivity. So suddenly collectivity started to be related with communism and it, it needed to be fighting within the US. Um, but where all this uh, story ends, so well, um, I'm gonna go very fast because I wanna spend time talking about what I'm working now. But um, I do think that we do research, we look back to history always from now, kind of George Kubler perception or idea. So history is what it is because we look from, from it with our contemporary eyes. And I look to that part of the 19th century thinking that it can be of value for nowadays. And that was one of the huge reference to build this building in Barcelona with Mayo, the architectural office that I um, co-run with my colleagues in Barcelona and New York, and that we had the opportunity to build the building in the Champla. And the building actually answered to that need to, def to define housing typologies that can embrace a wider social reality, that can embrace wider family structures beyond the nuclear one. And we wanted to define a space, a domestic space, that would be able to um, host any type of program as it happened in New York. And, and in a manner that the inhabitants would be the ones defining where the living room is, where the bedroom is, even where the kitchen is. 
So the room is, the building is defined by a set of rooms. We call it 110 rooms. There's the lack of high, special hierarchy and therefore lack of family pre type predetermination. And alongside that, following uh, the 19th century Kitchener's references, these apartments can, can enlarge and decrease in size in order to answer to our social um, changes and needs. We are aware that we don't have the same need of space in our different periods of our lifetime, but also our economical resources are different. And consequently, also the environmental impact that we do produce should be different and should be sizable as well, uh, and therefore reduced. Um, so this capacity of you know enlarging and decreasing the house that comes from the 19th century is this capacity to understand that the house can be a diffuse entity, which limits are not clear, is precisely what we're working on now in um, in social housing, and and we are pushing that idea. I'm jumping very fast now. We're pushing that idea in a construction of a social housing uh, building um, that contains 40 units. And as you see, the changes are almost very minimal. Here we have six rooms. One, it's an exterior room. And as you see, we always use these very, very large doors, not only because doors allow us to, legally speaking, consider any room for any program. So they're kind of loopholes that allow us to negotiate with the actual uh, Spanish housing regulation, but also allow two rooms to become especially one. So allow that flexibility and ambiguity to emerge very easily by means of a very, very, you know, ordinary element. And we work in the same manner for a housing uh, project, in a social housing project in Aguascalientes in Mexico, a project that was led by Tatiana Bilbao. And in that case, once again, um, we work with in the same exactly the same um, manner. Rooms that um, try to, to to be generic to have this uh, sense of um, program ambiguity. Here, the doors were placed in the corner, raising more ambiguity, more flexibility, because then the connectivity is not only in one direction but many. And, uh, and the size of the room here was extremely interesting because it was related with the size of a Mexican brick. So how big is that space is also a contextual uh, decision that not only relates with how we live in that context or that territory, but also how things are built. And and it's it's fascinating when you when you look to your own work because sometimes projects that emerge one year and you, you don't think about them any longer then reappear later on. And we did this uh, project when we were building 110 rooms um, for a gallery in New York, uh, Yeri Monti Gallery. We were asked to design a villa, uh, and uh, and as an answer, we took we bought a. a, a an architecture book of, of ordinary German houses, and we cut out the rooms. We took the rooms and scattered them on, on a piece of paper, and 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 that we sent, uh, we, we we placed this this scattered rooms on a territory, um, and we sent this floor plan as our villa's floor plan, and alongside this floor plan, we built this model that is based on the extrusion of these rooms. In order to raise ambiguity, look into the floor plan, it was very difficult to distinguish where the house started and then. It was very difficult to distinguish if we were proposing one house or many. It was very difficult to distinguish if we were talking about a city or a town or just one extremely big house. Um, the model helped with that, right? Because it was difficult to say if those floor plans were related with the room or with a building or with the tower. And with this project, we started talking about the idea of the diffuse house. How to define houses as it happened in 110 rooms, but that do merge with the urban sphere and do merge with the idea of the public. How to break down and start 
decolonizing, dismantling all those constructions and classifications that have produced so many biases. And alongside that, how to rethink how reproductive labor and care is taking care is is taking um, care in those uh, infrast in that type of living in that type of city, and that's why I have been working this uh, last years on a urban typology on a urban kitchen typology that has emerged in the last forty years in different territories as an answer to the crisis that this late capitalism is producing crisis in relation with migration, crisis in relation with gender struggle, crisis in relation, crisis that answer to the theriopatrical system. And, and the first case emerged in um, Lima. Um, this type of kitchen, um, it is a type of kitchen that it's run by a community, but it's not open just for that community, it's open to the public. And it's related with hundreds of them that are equal to that, and they all work as a network. So they are clearly different from collective kitchens that happen in co-housing or collective um, housing. They're urban infrastructures and metropolitan buildings. The first ones emerged around 1978 in Lima, answering to two uh, huge, massive strikes. At that time in the 70s, as you know, uh, Peru was um, um, deep into uh, different uh, social crises that end up in these two massive strikes that were led by academics. And as an answer, a group of women started to organize themselves first to cook, improvise and ephemeral and cooking pots. And las ollas comunes, ollas populares are quite well known, not only in Peru, but also in Chile and many and other territories in South America. Uh, and those acts of cooking together, usually they're related with crisis. And what was interesting at the time is that that improvised cooking infrastructure that happened answering to a particular crisis has started to be rooted in a permanent manner. So those groups of women started to organize themselves to cook, in that case, for their communities in their neighborhoods. Uh, the first ones emerged in El Agustino. And as you see, right from the beginning, they had a political character, not only because they emerged as an answer to strikes and social crisis, but also because at that time, um, women lack of a political voice. In Peru, women had access to vote, access to education. Legally speaking, they had access to many things, but that didn't meant a real access. And it, it was through this actions of cooking that they started to have a political voice. And that's why you have these images from, you know, um, early 80s and late 70s with these cookers placed in front of the cooking pot, but clearly formalizing themselves as a political session. And these um, kitchens do relate um, with um, most of um, the migrations that did happen in the city of Lima, and they are related with how the city grew and established and formalized itself during those years. So they are related with the construction of these neighborhoods. And women uh, were the ones actually uh, leading this construction alongside establishing these cooking infrastructures to to allow them to combine both works, right? The construction of the neighborhood alongside the taking care of their community and their families. Um, as I was mentioning, the first one started in Agustina, but they spread very fast, not only Lima, but in all Peru. And they became extremely powerful in the 80s and in particular in the 90s. Uh, and politically speaking, uh, they became a threat. And that's why um, they were attacked by many terrorist groups, uh, among other um, um, attacks, probably the most famous one was uh, the murder of uh, Maria Elena Moyano, um, um, which um, assassination was uh, 
public very um, uh, visualize um, very present in media and produce a deep concern. But um, that uh, those attacks, not only Maria Elena Moyano, many, many others, allows us to understand the deep relation between these cooking infrastructures and the political engagement. So the amount of agency that they had at the time and still nowadays. So these are actual images of them. They're usually very small. They're run by usually 15 women. So yes, they're biased, just women uh, do participate. And they do work in terms of three. So three women cook three every three days and every three days. And usually they cook for around 100 or 300 menus a day. The menu is sold for a very reduced price. Uh, those that lack of um, uh, economic resources, they can have the food for free. Uh, so they also do support those that cannot uh, have access to food. But anyone can go and, and, and eat. You can eat there or pick up the food and take it to go. And some of them, what is very interesting is that, you know, they have already 40 years. So we have second generation cookers and some of them have grew, grew enormously as uh, this one, La Balanza, uh, who uh, an amazing architecture project led by a large group of architects and um, who not, in which not only we can find the kitchen, but also there's a library, there's a study room, there's um, a space for um, activities, there's also a playground in front. They do actually act as pacifiers of the neighborhood. So they have become, become real civic centers and cores of neighborhoods. It's interesting to see, in the case of Lima, we have a long history, right? So we have different periods of success and decay of the type. And there, there was a moment, very interesting moment from 1980 to 1985 during Belaunde's uh, government in which um, his wife, um, uh, Violeta, who was uh, a deep activist and feminist, uh, and did uh, run a program to empower the kitchens and uh, arrange um, um, a department which would define and design a type that would expand within Lima. So some of them have been built by the government themselves, but most of them are placed in houses, in private houses. Uh, I'm working with a group of uh, research in, at Columbia University, mapping them. Just to give you a sense of numbers, and also once you map them, you realize that um, they are very the, the proximity of things, right? They're very close one to another. We have nowadays 2,500 kitchens in Lima. Just to give you a sense of size, in New York, there are um, 1,500 um, uh, public schools, and the population is more or less the same. So you have the amount, the sense of amount of impact. And, and and what's interesting is that Lima's, is, Lima's case is not alone. In the recent years, a similar kitchen has emerged in the city of Mexico that has a precedent in, of the 80s, but um, uh, that precedent of the 80s that emerged thanks to the Limanian influence has been empowered by the government of the city of Mexico after 2008 crisis. In 2009, the government started a program in which uh, invited citizens to start cooking in their own kitchens, in their homes, for the community. As an answer, the government would install an industrial kitchen and would give uh, some perishable foods uh, some non perishable food every 15 days as well as water. And as an answer, uh, the, a group of citizens, minimum three, so not only it's not only those that inhabited that house, anyone can cook and participate actively. Uh, they have to cook for the community, again, around 100, 300 meals per day. And in this case, they do receive a salary. So the government started this program in the case of Lima, we see an empowerment of women. In this case, anyone can work, anyone can participate. And the, 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 the government started this program precisely to generate new type of labor, precisely to change reproductive labor to paid labor, to assure that that work has 
a value, an economic value. And, uh, and well, again, the maps are very impressive. Um, in, in Mexico, numbers are lower. We have around 500. And similar numbers can be found as well in, in Tokyo, in which as well, uh, in this case, is not 2009, but very close by after the earthquake of 2011. Uh, so around 2012, many kitchens, many collective kitchens emerge, not only in Tokyo, but also in other cities of Japan. That in this case, answer to social fabric loss. So due to 2008, but precisely due to the earthquake, uh, there was a sense of uh, need of reestablishing neighbor bonds. And, and due to that, a new type of kitchen has emerged that is addressed, it was addressed initially just to, ki to kids. So citizens would cook for children, uh, with children, to assure um, good quality of, of food for dinner, but also social um, relation among them. But progressively, they started to be open to the population at large. So for me, what is interesting about all these cases is that they all answer to the struggles of the actual times. And what is mostly interesting about them is that they do relate with the new digital landscape. In particular, probably the one, the case that is most visible in, in that relation is precisely the Japanese case, because these kitchens are fluid. They are all connected, all these communities are connected online, Facebook, Instagram, and different similar and other platforms allow them to be connected and allow them to be flexible. So they occupy empty spaces of the city that do have already a cooking infrastructure and they are fluid. So their schedule type of occupation and, and space do change through time, answering to social needs. And that's for me what it's extremely interesting, not only how reproductive labor is being reshaped and taking care differently, but also how is that related with the way we live nowadays and our digital reality. And I will allow, stop here for a conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hannah, for this fantastic presentation. I think it's starting to, to create new forms of caring beyond domestic spaces and, and beyond social reproduction, as you, as you mentioned. The collective forms of uh, self-initiated or public infrastructures built against capitalist uh, conditions, but also born within them, both in the global south, but also taking place in privileged Western cities in a time of these growing inequalities and recurrent crises. I think it's also important to rethink our participation, and it's something that we already discussed when preparing this, this conversation. As designers, empower dynamics, and how can we effectively uh, commit to produce better futures in our in our context? Um, that's all, I think. Uh, welcome back, Paulo, and I let you guys discuss further ideas and common interests between your research projects. Thank you, Pablo, and thank you, Anna. Uh, it was so absolutely fascinating to hear you and see your presentation. And your approach to research and practices is truly inspiring to me. Um, I, I particularly enjoy how you start uh, with concrete architectural features and how those very concrete domestic territories in order to address themes and questions that are absolutely essential uh, to discuss in our uh, troubled and turbulent late capitalist times. Um, it made me think as well that the, the disciplines of um, architecture and design sometimes lack vocabularies that allow to understand what uh, is actually taking place in our cities and territories right before our eyes and how we miss sometimes paradoxically uh, the 
uh, to grasp and to decipher those uh, same uh, concrete um, uh, phenomena where we as, I mean, our disciplines are sometimes not able to speak the language of certain social and cultural phenomena that are very complex and sometimes are more um, enclosed in their, in its own discourse and its own um, um, yeah, language. And these thoughts also, in a way, resonated with my own research in, in Angola, in Luanda, where I tried to uncover reciprocities between parts of the city that are often seen as unrelated uh, and, and, and separated. And to give you, yeah, some particular examples, I, I was also uh, uncovering how these uh, semi covered areas sometimes in domestic spaces are connecting um, usually that verandas or corridors uh, that are becoming rooms themselves with use and functions and this made me question also the education I had in in, in, in you know uh, when when I studied architecture where we tend to um, label rooms as with a, a single use say uh, most of the time you know when when we have to really write down um, what the room is what is its function and i realized while doing field work it was quite difficult sometimes to label and 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 and, and um describe you no know, uh, or characterize these uh, rooms that can be um well, there, there can be kitchens, but living rooms and, and, and sometimes bedrooms, but also uh, even the way how, you know, the, the, the role that furniture plays in this. And I would uh, sometimes find a freezer at the bathroom door or uh, uh, pots and pans sharing a tabletop with a, with a TV or a laptop. And, uh, a wall used for hanging clothes, but also kitchen utensils and an oven placed next to the bed. You know, these hybrid um, rooms that um, in a way um, also give, show how rich our habits and our domestic territories or landscapes become. They, they are not uh, uh, fully represented in an architectural project or design and I'm, I mean, but you, you also mentioned the, the concept of flexibility, and I, I would perhaps provocate you with the concept of um, hybridity, um, in a way, in the sense that um, uh, flexibility is seems insufficient to describe the full scale of this ambiguity of this phenomenon, because it tends to refer to, uh, to adaptable, but not necessarily accommodate the nuances that take place simultaneously, no, but rather sequential. And the word hybrid may be an interesting categorization in that sense, because it implies a simultaneity of uses. And also it's a concept that is perhaps now entering in our post-COVID condition. And I wanted also to hear you about how you feel uh, or if you feel that in the in the West we are now finding new ways of domesticity that were taking shape for years in non Western contexts, um, what how do you feel that about that? Yeah, it's it's very interesting that the, the I I I totally agree with you. So I'm not gonna yeah totally right. Probably I should use other terms. And I I agree with you because I think that the term flexibility has been used to refer as you were. I'm mentioning like you know um when two things can happen right um and it has been always related with uh first the beginning of the 20th century to you know get most of the space so you it can be a living room but also a bedroom right so uh, a way to shrink uh, and make the space uh um, double uh, when it's not uh, but ultimately you're already predetermined which other, which two uses can happen, right? Uh, then in the 70s meant like um, moving things up and down, right? <laughs> like things that do move 
<laughs> and then are flexible. But again, that demands us to, you know, th there was a pre-categorization of things that those all those things that could happen. And it's true that probably now um, we we are talking about not flexibility but ambiguity in order to make those categories less clear, more blurry, more contradictory, and probably the, a, a process that would allow us to dismantle them progressively. But um, so yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree with you. And and also understanding that, you know, like um, one means um, diversity. Um, Understanding also that we do our social reality changes so fast, also we have to be able to adapt to all those changes. Mm -hmm. So ambiguity also addresses that. But, uh, how do you think those questions are or sh should be more uh, addressed in um, academia and in education? And I, I was mentioning the lack of vocabulary we have sometimes in our education to tackle these subjects and these questions how do you deal with that and how do you try in your academic practice to to come up with these uh, values i know i think i look paula i i i i yeah i agree with you that um one of the uh, coming back to the idea of flexibility, but now that you're addressing the idea of the book, how we name things, right? Naming is a, a extremely powerful tool. When it when you name it, it, it exists, right? But also through naming, you inevitably seclude things, produce seclusions of things. So, um, and, and I we're living in a moment that we are rethinking the way we talk and we name things, and we understand. Um, the power of language and we and in architecture precisely how powerful it is how powerful it is to teach students that you know that i was taught that i had to design a day part and a night part in a house which if you think about it you know like so all these um, ways of naming um the service room right the, uh, so all these ways of name naming are very powerful uh, so probably the easiest thing to do is to start renaming as you're inviting me to think. Mm -hmm. And probably you you know more than that based on your research, more than me. Well, well I don't know, I'm not sure about that, but I, I, I feel that uh, what I do feel is that we, um, that we have the majority of population in the world uh, living in, 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 in conditions that are not labeled in our education in the West, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I, I do. And, and so I think that we are still sometimes fixed with a discourse on uh, form and, you know, modernism or even postmodernism, but it's all kind of fixed on that uh, level. And I think maybe us uh, as uh, researchers and architects can also contribute to raise values that promote solidarity, that create bridges between an, an, a fragmented uh, worlds. And I, I don't, I wanted to, to ask you how, how you see your role as a, as a, as a teacher as well in the, in, 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 at Colombia, which is, you know, it's a very privileged uh, school. And uh, how do you try to uh, decolonize some of those um, yeah, the questions in 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 your school. Wait, can you hear me? Now I do. Yes, I just yeah. yeah sorry, I, I I was out just for a second. Yeah, how I try to deal with it. Um, well, I, we are in academia. We are in a stream in a very very interesting moment, and I pair it a little bit with. Uh, the impact of modernity in academia. So we are in a, in a moment of changing the discipline as as big as that one. And, and it is from, I think that we do have a responsibility, not only to, to, 
those that we operate from a very privileged um, um, schools to dismantle from within those schools how things have been done in order to be more um, equity and 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 fair, but also um, to reflect on how we talk and what we taught, what we teach. Uh, in academia and coming back to naming right like one of the things that um these last years i have been working with the professors the community at the school and the students is to reflect on naming and and i just want to give you one two couple of examples right we do tend to names to relate with positivity or negativity so we t we tend to think that community or collective are per se positive terms, which not necessarily. There are communities that uh, neglect other communities and generate a lot of biases. So not necessarily community or collective is positive. So to start to be critical with terminology, but also to be critical with how we use it, like the use of the term minority in in when we we talk about social justice, it can be it, it is deeply um, damaging because it is negative right and most of the, the the times when you read that term in an article or a text they don't refer to uh, less numbers right so minor should be less numbers usually they do refer to a community that has a neglect uh, neglected reality but maybe their numbers are extremely large let's uh, call about you know let's refer here to the african american community in harlem it cannot be tagged as, as a minority, not at all. And it has been tagged as a minority. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm back. Sorry. Yes, we had Bad a luck today. five second break, but you're, yeah. you're back. But <laughs> it, it's, it's very interesting what you were saying. And I, I was uh, trying to uh, or it reminded me of the way how we still represent and the questions of representation in, in, in architecture, for instance, when we tend to see, you know, these black and white plans that, that present public and private. And it's, it's really about this uh, uh, dichotomy and, and, and almost like this polarization that also doesn't describe often this ambiguity and 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 these uh, 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 the richness of these complex uh, urban spaces and how do you deal with representation and and um, yeah through ar architectural means to address those um, learnings that you 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 you're bringing from, from the, those uh, layers that you you're bringing from your uh, research and so on. Ah, we just um, lost Anna for a second. Yeah, I think we can wait a little bit for her because I think yes. she's having problems with the with the internet connection. Right. It's um, yeah. You see, even in New York, you you miss uh, Wi-Fi uh, <laughs> network. It can happen anywhere. Maybe we can wait a little bit with a video. I think it's back. She's back. Right. I'm deeply sorry. Yeah. Worries. Okay. No, 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 no you worries. Um, I, I was saying how what you were talking about is uh, dichotomies, positive, mm -hmm. negative, and so on, reminded me of the way we still see lots of representations of the city in this black and white plans that say private, public, and how that kind of creates a dichotomy that doesn't represent the full fullness of, of, of life and these ambigu ambiguous spaces in between. And how do you address the issue of representation and turning these thoughts and these learnings into, you know, drawings or technical uh, uh, representations? Um, 
Well, this is a crucial thing that I don't have an answer, but we do really need to rethink how we draw and how we represent architecture. Um, and probably be critical with the impact of how we we are communicating architecture. Um, understanding its values, right? We do uh, use uh, now these uh, social platforms. Um, we but uh, that are mostly based on image. We do have to be critical with that, or at least how to use the image in a way that goes beyond the flatness of of its condition. And but also to understand that a line. It is meaningful. So, as you say, like just to, that, our city replicates, for instance, property lines, and we don't question that. And most of the time, mm -hmm. the maps that we draw are based on property lines, right? So, how, a way to start disempowering property lines or the condition of property probably would be like not to reinforce that with our drawings, with the drawings of the city, and and. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad to see uh, many, many architects reflecting on that. The last, uh, and, uh, and I, I have the feeling that there's a change going on in relation with the relation between private and public on that note, trying to blur those, those limits. And it's naturally happen, uh, happening in the way we live, right? We can be extremely critical with Airbnb and many other platforms, but one of the consequences is the way we understand public and private are also shifting. So socially speaking, I think that our society is going fast with architecture. That's normal. That always happened, right? We're a little bit behind, but which are going to be the consequences of that? There's no social realities in housing. It's uh, still a big question mark, but a very interesting one to have. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, for me, buildings like the the one that uh, B plus uh, built in in Berlin, in which the pub, the street literally can have access to the whole building, is a way, for instance, to give back public property from a a, pub, a private property from a, a private um, uh, in initiative, and that's extremely yeah. powerful. Just don't place a door. Right, just in place a door yeah. and allow the people to access. That's that's already very radical. Yeah, I, I've seen the presentation at the Triennale de Lisboa um, uh, session on the other day uh, with uh, Mayo, and it's uh, it, are these questions that you uh, you are. I mean, you also uh, showed some of the housing projects you you work in practice and. Um, are there uh, direct consequences of the research you're doing as you, Anna, in the practices you're part of, Mayo? And how, how, how does research feed and, 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 and is brought into the design work? Well, um, the, the, you know, the, the relations are always much more complex and diffuse than saying, okay, I do research about collective cooking, I will design collective kitchens. I think that that's, I would be like a too, too linear, simplistic manner, but it's a much more ambiguous condition. Obviously, we do have the pairing of the typology of 110 rooms with the research, and that's literally a copy. Um, but in terms of uh, how um, reproductive labor is taking care of and by um, there are many many tools that uh, we have been trying to engage with uh, through design um, not only by thinking of collective kitchens but also where you can place the kitchen and if you can not even have it so thinking about how productive productive labor will be taking care in those infrastructures is a way of already, so when you design, already make a change. Mm -hmm. I, I'm also, uh, I guess I, I'm addressing this, uh, we had a quick chat the other day about this question of observational or participant uh, research. And, you know, I, I guess these are the struggles I also deal with uh, a lot because I'm often an outsider in the places where I'm working. But I do believe in uh, engaging through design or through practice, 
especially by setting up collaborations or facilitating, you know, local connections and, and, and knowledge that can be then uh, used, uh, yeah, part of, of uh, projects and, and even in, in, I don't mean building per se, but perhaps, you know, cultural projects we often sometimes do in cultural uh, events and so on. Uh, but it, I felt you were uh, not so keen on this idea. And I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm laughing for the audience because we, uh, we, we met before to prepare a little bit this talk and, and we discussed deeply about this. <laughs> and, um, and Paolo was, uh, um, you know, uh, approaching research. I'm back. Sorry. Yes. So, as I was saying, uh, we had a, 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 a very interesting and, and hot discussion about how to approach research, right? Because we both come from Western territories, uh, doing research in non-Western territories, how to deal with, um, you know, you I think. I okay, I'm back. I... Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So uh, I, I was saying that we were talking about how to deal with the condition of, of, of being the outsider, right? And how to, to, to not perpetuate certain colonial attitudes, right? And, um, and I was, I, I was confessing to Paolo that I, I, I do go there basically from a Western perspective that I'm extractive in culture, literally. I think that those cases are extremely marvelous and super interesting uh, from our territorial perspective. Um, so I definitely am like, you know, like literally an outsider that observes and, and, and takes notes uh, because that is interesting from my territory, my cultural territory, that ends up being, you know, like Europe, US. That's it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it's true that that how you approach research in a territory is a personal decision, right? And you were uh, Paolo referring to it's true that that knowledge does not necessarily exist. That's true, and you might actually give something back to the territory that you look to, or, or skills. I mean. Sometimes the knowledge is there, and I'm interested to learn. I think I'm always have this approach of I'm here to learn when I try to start a project elsewhere where I'm an outsider, and and sometimes my contribution can be really to uh, improve already existing solutions or, or, or designs that are you know small scale and simple things instead of uh, bringing something else, you know, from, from whatever I, I uh, uh, imagine or, or, or uh, every, uh, something that comes from my head, if you know what I mean. And in, in that sense, I, I see that uh, architects and researchers, designers can also act as uh, facilitators of no local knowledge and bring, uh, so like skills that can be further de developed in, in in design or through design and i don't know i i look at uh, the beautiful photos you you showed from the kitchen rooms and they are some of them are nicely very nicely designed you know like especially in tokyo there is was very neat um do do you are you interested in the design of these rooms and uh, or what is, uh, say, the most, uh, uh, what attracts you really to, to, to these spaces? Yeah, like, um, I think the design is always there. Like, I, I, I see your point. Um, I'm, I'm more skeptical about me intervening on anything because, I, again, as I was saying, I, I do... I, I do have kind of a respect of, of of the territory and somehow I do prefer not to place myself in a, in that role um, but rather again from an outsider but um, 
architects do have an important role uh, and design has an important role. One of the critical points nowadays in how collective kitchens are designed in Lima and built and designed in, build in Lima is precisely because until now, all the walls have been always been opaque, not transparent. Uh, those that you are acquainted with Lima, the weather is amazing, never rains, <laughs> always mild temperature. Winter is winter, but very mild. So it's a fascinating territory that you can literally have a very light facade and even completely open, completely exposed to outside. But the story of these kitchens have been um, quite, not only controversial, but, um, you know, violent one. So for them, the walls have been very meaningful. So I, I think that, yes, design, is important. Uh, Japanese kitchens have been able to expand enormously because most of them, they do have large windows, so are exposed permanently to the public and, and that visibility a low engagement. In Lima, for instance, is something that is very contested nowadays. To open or keep on being uh, secluded within, you know, a group. Mm -hmm. And, and I, yeah, design is always there. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to, to ruin your party, but I think we are we have to go after time because we'll love to continue the conversation, but in five or ten minutes we will be starting the second session. We'd like to thank you again, uh, Anna and Paolo, for opening the spot in your agenda to be in this very small public program and for being so generous to for sharing your research project uh, with us. And uh, for the audience, we'll see you all at the other room. We'll be streaming the conversation between Ana Naomi de Sousa, Bernardo Amaral, and Sinio Baeza de Pina. And uh, just to close, we would like to, to thank again Ana and Paulo. And we hope we can meet uh, physically very soon. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much, Paulo. Thank you, thank, thank you, Ana. It was a pleasure. It was thank a you, pleasure. Pablo. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Patrick. Bye. Bye. Bye.